one thing is certain if you stick to the word you will come back with a testimony what God wants to give you in your life is not a healing what God wants to give you in your life is not a job what God wants to give you in your life is not money what God wants to give you is the word of God in your spirit it will make you what it talks about and you are shining and you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost you are shining by the power of the Holy Ghost you are shining and nothing can stop you it is your season it is your time nothing can hinder you this is your time this is your hour favor is yours Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we worship you, we honor you, and thank you for your kindness, for your love, for your glory in our lives, leading us, revealing to us the things of the kingdom. Like you said, the secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. Tonight we open our hearts and our minds to be taught, to be instructed, to be inspired, to learn from you. Guard our minds to the scriptures tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you have a beautiful day? Okay. What are we studying? The book of Romans. We are still there. We will take a few steps further today. Where did we get to? Where was it? You don't remember? Where? Romans what? Chapter 2. Verse. We finished 2. Good. Thank you. All right. So we finished chapter 2. Now we're in chapter 3. And... Um, he begins the main theme of the book in chapter 3. Paul begins the main theme of the book of Romans in chapter 3. I want to read from verse 3. Now, now remember, remember the background of this book. He is looking at the Jews and he he wants the people to know that there is a new order of things there is a new covenant he's letting them know they couldn't continue in the old way because god was done with the old covenant and now there's a new one hallelujah there's a new covenant. All right. What advantage then hath the Jew? Or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly because that under them were committed the oracles of God. Did you understand that? Did you understand those two verses? Did you get anything from there? Come on. Did you understand anything there? I want to hear from somebody. Who got something there? Did you understand what he said? Yeah. Who did? We haven't even started. I just want to know if, you, if you're following. Okay. I just want to get your attention. Verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith 
of God without effect? He says, hey, um, from what we're saying, you remember the, the, the second chapter when we studied certain things and he was addressing the Jew and he was asking, uh, you say you're a Jew, a teacher of the law and so on and so forth. Um, you tell people don't do this, but do you do such things? Do you break the law? You say you're a Jew. Then he concluded chapter 2 by saying that the one who is a Jew outwardly is not a real Jew. That if you're a real Jew, you'll be a Jew inwardly. You remember? Then it says in, in verse 1, chapter 3, what advantage then had the Jew? Does a Jew have any advantage? He says, yeah, there is. There is. He says, much every way in verse 2. Much every, every way. He says, because chiefly, because uh, that unto them were committed the oracles of God. See, God gave them the, the laws. God gave them the vision, the message. God gave it to them. But then he says, what if some of them didn't believe? Can you see that? Even though God gave it to them, what if they didn't believe? Will it change God's faithfulness? He says, no. All right. So, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their own belief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar, as it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sins, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. But if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? I speak as a man. God forbid, for then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? You know what he's talking about here? Now, you know, the Jews didn't believe in what Paul was preaching. And uh, Paul is saying, if, if you say that I'm lying, and yet my lie <laughs> is bringing glory to God and declaring his righteousness, why, do I, why am I still being judged as a sinner? If my lie is being proved of God. He's saying, I'm not lying. That's actually what he's telling them. Praise the Lord. He says, if our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God, they, they think we are unrighteous. But how can our unrighteousness commend the righteousness of God? Verse 6. He says, God forbid, how then shall, shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory. See? Now you say, I'm lying. And yet, this thing you're calling a lie is, is, is showing forth the truth of God. How am I a sinner? Can't you see that I'm not lying? That's what he's, that's what he's really saying. Praise God. So I go verse 7 again. For if the truth of God had more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? And not rather as we be slanderously reported. Are you seeing that in parentheses? As we be slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, let us do evil that good may come, whose damnation is just. Praise God. See, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. Now, I, I'm going to bring out something for you here that's very, very important. I, I want you to begin to follow. If you miss us here, um, start sleeping. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. You see, the Jews always wanted to declare that they were the righteous ones, all because they had the law. And then they said the Gentiles were the heathen. They didn't have any law. They were estranged from the covenants of God and without hope. But Paul is saying that's not enough to make you a righteous man. Just because you have the law. Because if you have the law, you have to obey the law. But then Paul wants to get something from the law to show the Jew who he really is. Are you ready for this? <sighs> Verse 9, one more time. What then? Are we better than they? No, you know why? So we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. 
As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. He is quoting the law. Are you here? He is quoting the law. The very law that the Old Testament folks were believing in and walking with said there is none righteous. And Paul searched the scripture to let them understand. Watch this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. He's quoting the law. Their, their throat is an open sepulchre. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. He's quoting the law. Look at verse 19. Now we know that what things... Now, <laughs> this is beautiful. This guy was a good lawyer. Listen to verse 19. He's, he's just quoted the law. Then he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. He's letting those folks know this is to you. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. He's saying both Jews and Gentiles are all guilty. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. See, they were all condemned under the law. The law said there's none righteous, no, not one. That's what the law said. Now, you know some Christians, because they don't understand the scriptures, they have read this and they thought this was addressed to everybody. And so they say, well, nobody can be righteous. No, not one. The Bible says so. You say, where? They say, turn to Romans chapter 3, I'll show it to you. And they turn in here and, and it's not addressed to us. The man's talking to the Jews. He's letting the Jew know that under the Jewish covenant, they couldn't be righteous. But now, verse 21, hallelujah. But now, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Oh, hallelujah. Just wonderful. Wonderful. Let's take it one after the other. Verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. He's saying there is a righteousness from God that has nothing to do with the law. It's outside of the law. It's outside the law. You can get this righteousness without obeying the law. And this, he says, is the righteousness of God. You can get it without the law. It's manifested. Witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, he says in verse 22, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Oh. Yesterday, yesterday is Sunday. Now, I, I do not say this to be critical of anybody. No, 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 a thousand times, no. I, I was listening to a preacher. And um, they were having an interview and uh, the preacher was asked a simple question because of the uh, several references that was made to uh, when you give your life to Christ or when I gave my life to Christ and so on and so forth. So the interviewer said, what exactly does it mean to give your life to Christ? And this renowned preacher, to my greatest amazement, 
couldn't explain it. The answer was, to give your life to Christ is to let God rule your life and then you start reading the Bible. I I'm quoting him. I said, dear Lord Jesus, what a blessed opportunity to explain the gospel. Now, I, I, I brought that in to say this. I think it's good for me to explain that to you because a lot of people don't know, including many, many preachers. This is, this is a very, very well-known preacher who couldn't explain. After making several references to giving one's life to Christ, I, I was actually, I, I was expecting such a question because after saying so many things about giving, I thought the audience would like to know what it is to give your life to Christ. And then the question came, but it turned out to be a bombshell. Now let me explain that to you. All right? What is it to give your life to Christ? When you say you give your life to Christ. To give one's life to Christ simply means to take his salvation as your house. Watch this. It means that you put your life inside his own. In other words, that you identify your life with him because he was the one who died for us. Now, if I give him my life, it means that I've identified my life with his life and that's where I get salvation because he died for me. So I give him my life, it means that he has become my Lord. I have accepted his salvation. So when you say, I gave my life to Christ, you are saying that you put your life out of your own free will into his hands of salvation. Because he is the one who saved us. It, why, why is this explanation being given to you like this? Because salvation is likened to the ark of Noah. Are you hearing this? And so everybody who entered the ark was saved. So when you say you gave your life to Christ, you have entered the ark. He is the ark. So that's why I said you have actually entered into his house. You have put your life in his hands. In other words, you've identified yourself with him for salvation. Because it says all those who come to him are saved. So I gave my life to him for salvation. So I entered his ark. I got into his house. You see that? Did you, did you get it? See, an understanding of the scriptures is actually what helps us. If you do not understand the scriptures, you don't know what it means. You say, well, I gave my life to Christ. What you're thinking of is I surrendered. When you got married as a woman to Mr. So-and-so, you didn't surrender. <laughs> Was it, did you surrender? Uh, if, those of you who are married, what, did you surrender? You see, in their, because they don't understand the scriptures, they think that when you say, I gave my life to Christ, you are saying, I have surrendered my life. You didn't surrender your life. It's not a surrendering. When that woman got married to that man, what she did was, she got into the man's house. She got identified with the man. And both of them began to share one name and one life. They became one. She... Are you catching this? So there are a lot of things that we, 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 we say uh, in the kingdom of God and when people don't understand the scriptures, they can't interpret them. They don't know what they are. It's like asking, asking someone, what is it to be born again? That's actually the same question, kind of question. What is it to be born again? And then the fellow says, well, to be born again, it means that um, you give your life to Christ. Now, he doesn't understand it. So you give your life to Christ and then uh, you start reading the Bible and praying every day. You have, that's religion. You just, I mean, you have just defined religion. That's religion. 
It's another way of saying you just give your life to Mohammed and then you start praying every day. It, it, you see, it, it shows how little is known of eternal life. It shows how little is known of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He didn't come to take our lives. Hello? Okay. Oh, boy. All right. Follow this. Follow this. This is the reason many misunderstand righteousness. Righteousness. If you don't have the tapes on the subject of righteousness, better go get them. You have to have them. You have to listen to them again and again and again and again and again. Because the Bible says that the one who does not understand the doctrine of righteousness is a baby. And that that person cannot do spiritual warfare. He says that one is not skillful in the use of the word. He's not skillful. Which means he will be defeated by the devil. He will continually be defeated by the devil. Because he doesn't understand righteousness. How many of you have heard me talk about it on TV? Let me see your hand up. Let me see your hand up. Put down your hand. How many of you haven't heard me talk about it on TV? Put up your hand. You couldn't be at the middle. Come on now. Let me see your hand. Put up your hand. Let me see you. How come you haven't heard? You don't watch the TV programs? Because if you're hungry for something, you go for it. You, you, you can't grow without such things. And, and I, I, I've been sharing recently on the person of Jesus. And I'm saying very, very important things. Hey, come on. What are you thinking about? How do you grow? Oh, boy, boy, boy. Yep. Are you here? Okay. Verse 22. It says, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, and all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have seen and come short of the glory of God. Being justified. Now, in this verse, in verse 24, there are four or oh, three words that I, I'd like us to look at. Being justified. That's number one. Freely by by his grace, that's number two, through the redemption, that's number three, that is in Christ Jesus. He says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What is it to be justified? To be justified means to be declared righteous. It means to be declared righteous. Declared righteous. That is the legal side of our righteousness. The legal side of our righteousness. We are declared righteous. Why? He says, freely by his grace. What does it mean, grace? By his divine favor. There is this favor that God unleashed toward us by Jesus Christ. He poured out his love. Grace unmerited see it was a unmerited favor yes um, unmerited favor needs to be clearly defined what you mean when you say unmerited favor it means that we did not qualify by our works all right we did not qualify by our works we were favored of god not because we gained it through our own works of righteousness but because he loved us that's why he says through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus because there are different kinds of redemption now but this is the redemption in Christ Jesus what makes the difference all right now you could redeem uh, a man by the blood of a lamb or blood of a bull or something you could redeem somebody through anything else from another man you could redeem a slave from a, from a king or from a uh, from his master by paying a certain price you could redeem your brother by paying a certain amount maybe anything whatever they asked for but then there is the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now this redemption brought us out of the dominion of darkness. And he brought us out, you see, from what were we, were we redeemed? Hmm. Several years ago, I believe way back 83, 
83 or 82, I was, I was studying um, along these lines, uh, Watchman Nee. Watchman Nee said something that was very enlightening. But um, I want to throw more light on what Watchman Nee said. Um, he was trying to explain from what are we redeemed. And then he said, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Now, way back 1982, I thought Watchman Nee was right. But by 1984, I knew he was wrong. Are you still here? Okay, I'll explain something. Um, he was partially right in the general terminology. But scripturally, it was wrong and could not be applied in a way that will help, um, help anybody. Number one. When you say, we were redeemed from the curse of the law, he was only partially right. Now, from what were we redeemed? He said, we were not redeemed from sin. Then he said, we were not redeemed from the devil. He said, we were redeemed from the curse of the law. And then he cited the Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 as his uh, reference. Well, it took me a while, so by 1984, I had studied that portion myself. On getting there, I found out that um, that's not even true. Only the Jew was redeemed from the curse of the law, because only the Jew was under the curse of the law. The law was not given to the Gentiles. You'd have to be a Jew to be under the law. So only the Jew was redeemed from the curse of the law. So that's where he was wrong. Now to go on, you have to understand that redemption has to be clearly defined. Redemption is in, is in three different phases. Number one, there is the redemption of a prisoner when a, when a, a great king came into town and defeated that, that, that city or that country and then freed all the prisoners. Notice he didn't pay a price. He came as a conqueror. Did you hear that? So, come on, are you with me? This king came in, or this captain, or this general came in and conquered this city, or this country, whatever it was, and then freed all the prisoners. He didn't pay any special price to anybody. He came as a conqueror and set all the prisoners free. He redeemed them. Now the price you would say he paid would then be the price of war. Is that okay? But gave nothing to somebody. So you could say it was at the risk of his own life. Which is different from the other kind of redemption. Now in this kind of redemption, that's the second kind. I said there are three phases. Now, in this kind of redemption, here is uh, a man who is, who is a slave. And then I want to set him free from his master. Maybe for some reason I want him to do something or I want to... So I have to come with the price of the slave. And I talk to the one who is his present master. And I say, I, I want this slave. Would you sell him to me? And the one says, all right, I'll sell him to you. How much? He says, he's a cheap one. He's a very lazy guy. I'll sell him for 500 naira. Pretty cheap. <laughs> so I pay 500 naira and I buy this slave. And this slave now has been bought with a price. That Okay. Then I say, you are now my property, but you go, you are free, do what you choose. I have set him free by paying a price. I bought him and then set him free. Now that's different. I gave someone an actual price. I gave him. Praise God. Then you come 
to the third one where the legal redeemer comes in his brother has been enslaved by force or has been uh, captured by force or his brother gave himself to be a slave because he was in debt he couldn't pay so now I have come to redeem my brother and uh, I have to pay the price now the one to whom he is indebted says uh, you'll have to pay the exact amount then I say all right I'll pay so I am the Redeemer whether or not he wants to let my brother go he's got to let him go because by law I am the Redeemer I am known as the Redeemer nobody else can come and pay that sum I am the only one allowed to pay that sum to redeem him so I come and I paid the amount and then he is let go I have come as the Redeemer and I've set him free but I paid a price I paid are you following this now when you look at these three areas we were redeemed from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ and um, Jesus paid with his own blood to who Almighty God because we were in bondage because of our sins and so we owed God something for sinning so we were redeemed from the wrath of God so that's the price of sin hallelujah then as the conqueror who we were delivered redeemed from the hand of the devil Jesus didn't have to give him any price. He conquered that devil and set us free, broke the chains of darkness and set us free. Oh, hallelujah. And then, who were redeemed from the forces of darkness, from the world, really. From the world, the powers of this age. Again, that will have to do with the devil. Because the devil got us in two ways. Do you understand? He got us by, by the, the sin that was committed. And then he got us by the word that was delivered to him. He is the author of sin. And then at the same time, he was the God of this world. But now... He's only the God of the world system. But the whole world also belonged to him, did belong to him, because, the, because Adam sold out to him. So everything that was inside, he took over. And so Jesus came. And he said, cheer up, I've overcome the world. He had to live a sinless life. He had to win in this world. He had to defeat the world. He had to prove himself. And then he overcame the world. Guess what he did? He gave us the victory. But to be able to give us the victory, he had to first bind a strong man. The Bible says you cannot spoil a strong man's house except you, you, you first bind him. So he had to defeat the devil first in his own territory. And that he did on earth before he died so he defeated the world if he defeated the world he had to have defeated the God of this world first and then on the cross he settled the issue of sin forever hallelujah then he died and went to the grave and came out and here was his blood he presented it to the father so in the three ways we were redeemed hallelujah but the Jew was redeemed from the curse of the law by Jesus being crucified on the cross because the Bible says cursed is everyone that hang it on a tree and he did that for the Jew so the Jew could be redeemed from the curse of the law but when he died on the cross for us 
He shed his blood for us. So you see, he did two things right there. One was for the whole world, and then one was for the Jew. Because the Jew broke the covenant. We didn't break any covenant because we didn't have any. But we were just living in sin right from Adam. Praise God. All right, so are you still here? Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set for to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. Remission of sins, the removal of sins, praise God, hallelujah. That's the blotting out of sin. Oh, hallelujah. That's the great difference between remission and forgiveness. In forgiveness, he overlooks. You see, he passes over. But in remission, the sin is actually removed. Did you ever use um, hush, what they call a blood and paper? Did you ever use it to take out a stain? To drain something out? Did you ever use it? Good. He removed sin from our lives. That's the remission of sins. He says, his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the, through the forbearance of God. Now, those two lines I'd like to explain to you. See, many times there are terms that we find, and if we're not careful, we will not understand what the real teaching in that area is. Now, this teaching here is not referring to our remission of sins, the remission of our sins. That's not what is being referred to here. Even though the subject of remission in all the word of God has to do with us. But in this particular portion, it's got nothing to do with us. Us here now. Hello. Show it to you. He says, Whom God had set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He is saying that there were sins that were, that, that, that were committed under the old covenant that didn't get the real punishment. Are you following this? They didn't get the just punishment. And the Bible says the blood of bulls and of goats cannot take away sin. But God had to allow the blood of bulls and goats to be used at the time. But their sins were not taken away. Even though they sacrificed year after year. Bible says that at the end of each year, there was a remembrance again of sin. So that's what it's referring to here about sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. He had to overlook those things for the time. But every year there was a remembrance of those same sins that were overlooked last year. <laughs> Praise God. Okay, now let's, let's look at something that refers to this in Hebrews 9 chapter and um, the 15th verse. Are you there? I want to read from verse 11 will be all right. Yep, 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 yep. But Christ being come and I, priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. Hey, did we have a study in the book of Hebrews? We did. We did. We did. Say yes, yes. <laughs> Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an aphor, sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, oh hallelujah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, this is what I want you to mark, verse 15. For this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Hallelujah. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament. Did you see that? Uh -huh. Look at it again. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death... 
for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Did you see that? That by means of death, he removed what? The transgressions that were under the first testament. That's the same thing he's talking about in Hebrews, the third chapter, and the 25th verse. He says, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 26, to declare, I say at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. That he might be just and the justifier. He is righteous and the righteousness of him that believes in Jesus. He is my righteousness. Hallelujah. He is just. He is righteous. He proved himself righteous. And is my righteousness. Therefore. No, no, no. Verse, verse 27. Who, where is boasting then? It is excluded. Now, there's another beautiful thing you have to underline here. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Faith is a law. You see, you can operate by the law of faith. You see, like you have the law of gravity in the physical world. You have the law of faith in the spiritual world. Praise God. See, the law of gravity works every time. If it's a law, it'll work every time until it is superseded by a higher law. The law of gravity works every time. Every time. Until it is superseded by the law of lift. Hallelujah. Now the law of faith works. Oh glory. That's, oh. Where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay. But by the law of faith. Of works? Nay. It says where is boasting then? And how I like to draw the attention of those who talk about paying the price. They pay the price. You know, they fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And so God heard them and gave them a special anointing. And so because of that, that 40 days and 40, If you can't fast for 40 days and 40 nights, you're not going to get that kind of anointing. So that, 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 that gives opportunity for boasting. See? Somebody could have done something and gotten a blessing from God. But I want you to know that it was not that thing that that fellow did in the New Testament here. It wasn't that thing that he did that gave him the blessing. It only helped him to open up to receive the blessing. Are you getting the idea? Yeah. He says, where is boasting then? He says, it is cancelled. <laughs> That's the meaning of it's excluded. No, it's cancelled. No more boasting. Now you can't boast because everybody and anybody can get it. By what law? By the law of faith, not the law of works. Hallelujah. No matter what I do and I do better than you, it just, it doesn't matter. It's not going to tell that I'm more righteous than you are or more qualified than you are because my qualification is the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Can you say amen? amen? A man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Is he the God of the Jews only? See, this guy is getting mad at the Jews. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also, seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and uncircumcision through faith. Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. We establish the law. Talking to somebody the other day, he said, uh, uh, he said uh, I listened to one of your tapes. And I said, oh, praise God. He said, but you said... Um, Ah, he said, you said a, a lot of things uh, as though we shouldn't even follow the, the, the Old Testament at all. We shouldn't follow the law, uh, the commandments. He said, but why do we then read from the, from the commandments? From the, from the Old Testament. Why do we read from the Old Testament? I said, because we have, 
you see, reading the Old Testament lets us know what you call precedence. See, it lets us understand the mind of God concerning certain things. We don't live our lives according to the Old Testament. There's a lot of good blessings in the Old Testament, but the ones in the New are far better. Hallelujah. The better. Where something isn't clear to you in the New Testament, you can go to the Old and just find out what, how did God think about these things. That's the way. The Bible says the, old, the things that were written at time were written for our learning, for our learning, amen, for our admonition, praise God. So that's some blessing there. So we studied the Old Testament. But we don't live our lives according to the Old Testament. It's been abolished. Hallelujah. It's been abolished. So we get blessed. No, we, there's a lot of wisdom in the word of God. Amen. So we study there and, and there's so much to learn. Oh boy, there's so much to learn in the Old Testament. But the commandments and the, 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 the ordinances have been cancelled. Okay? Why do I not steal? I do not steal. Not because it says thou shalt not steal. No, a thousand times no. That's not the reason I don't steal. You see, there's a life in me that doesn't steal. <laughs> see, there's a difference now. I cannot steal. See, I wouldn't steal because the life in me doesn't steal. I want you to understand, God gave the laws out of his righteousness. All right? Now, God is righteous, and when he gave them the laws, the laws were righteous, because the laws came from God. But the very thing, the very, very life in God that made him to give such righteous laws. See, if God says don't steal, it means God doesn't steal. God's not going to steal. God doesn't like to steal, because God knows it is wrong to steal. Do you understand? Now, something in God made him say, don't steal. He knew it was wrong to steal. He is the one with which you can measure righteousness. You can tell what's right or what's wrong from God. See, he is light. In him, there's no darkness at all. So when God says it's wrong to steal, you don't have to go anywhere else to find out whether it's right or wrong to steal. If God says that thing is wrong, God is the one that is right. Do you understand? Now, that very thing in God. That makes him so different that he wouldn't steal. See, God don't need no laws. Nobody tells God not to steal. Nobody tells God not to lie. It's in him not to steal. It's in him not to lie. It's just his nature. Now that very nature he put in me. So I don't need anybody tell me not to steal. Because I'm not going to steal. The life in me don't steal. See, a cat doesn't back. A cat doesn't back. It's not in him to back. It's not in me to steal. You understand what I'm talking about? Yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. See, so those commandments have been canceled. That's what the Bible says. The law was not made for a righteous man. Yeah. The law was not made for a righteous man. Hallelujah. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When does a man sin? What is sin? Sin is not worshipping God without putting a scarf on your head. The Bible didn't talk about a scarf. Well, that's why some people use tissue. They say, we want to pray. Ah, please, hold on. No. They, say, they can't find a handkerchief. Do you have tissue? Just put that stinking, dirty, toilet-only paper and put it on the head. And then they go... Because they think that's what makes them qualified to be heard in heaven. If I, put, uh, if I open my hair, God's not going to hear me. Some don't even use uh, earrings and bangles and rings and all these things. They say, ah, ah, Aaron used them to make the golden calf back in the Old Testament. <laughs> but what, what, what's that to you? That's Aaron's problem. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
that stopped him from going into the, the, to the promised land, but that didn't stop Joshua. Hallelujah. To wear a ring doesn't stop you from going to heaven. Why? Why would it stop you? Hallelujah. See, God is not against his children being rich. He's not against his children having good things. He's not against his children looking good. He just doesn't want them to be covetous. And he doesn't want them to be ruled by things of this earth. You understand? He doesn't want, he doesn't want the things of this world to get you to put you in bondage. Here is a guy, he has not had a TV before. And so he, he would pray, he would study the Bible, he would do all the nice things. Now he's bought a TV and he would he always stay glued to the TV. Everything that comes on screen, he will look. <laughs> he just keep looking, just keep watching. He's forever watching. Sometimes you can sit down looking at the screen with all the yellow blue lines and all you remember they haven't started yet They're going to start at 6 p.m. It's 4 p.m. No, a lot of guys do it. They just keep watching. Just keep looking. You wonder what, they, what is it you're seeing? You see what has happened is something is taking the place of God in his life Something is taking the place of God in his life. There are things in the Bible that we are told can take away your heart. Can take away your heart from God. And you have to understand what these things are and be careful about them. They, they pull your heart away from God. So God doesn't, he's not, he's not against anything that you really want, that is nice. No. But when that thing gets you, that's where the trouble is. Have you ever bought a new car and just felt like going out, just driving around town? Going to particularly nowhere. Just wanting to drive. Now you want to go and see brother so and so you haven't seen him for some time now when you didn't have a car you didn't go anywhere you haven't seen him for some time now you just have to go even though you're, you're told he may not be in you think I, I can still try <laughs> the truth is you just want to drive <laughs> yeah there's nothing wrong with it but but when it starts taking the better part of you then trouble is coming the trouble is coming same thing with people, you know, they get into a relationship, you know, and uh, they, they love that fellow. And so I'm going to see her. And so you go and see her and then you stay there and you, well, we will pray. You wouldn't pray. You talk all for hours. Ah, I, I, I came here by 2, 7 p.m. Can you believe that? And she says, mm -hmm. She, she, she can't believe it. Is it really seven? It's like five o'clock. <laughs> they say, let's pray. And how many minutes? Three minutes. And you're done. <laughs> you came for a prayer. Three minutes and you're done. Have you ever, do you understand what I'm talking about? Sometimes we, 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 we meet with folks, you know, we have decided we're going to pray. We, 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 having a nice prayer meeting. And then we spend a long time talking. And then we get too tired to want to pray. We don't even have the motivation to pray now. We even eat first. <laughs> the guy whose house we're meeting, who you bring out something, who eat. And relax. And then the guy's all right. So it's time to pray. Okay. I'm trying to shake it off. Father, in the name of Jesus. There's nothing to say anymore. Praise the Lord. And that's one, one thing that we also have to be careful about when we have a prayer meeting in church. All right? 
you will have a prayer meeting and we know it's a prayer meeting we have announced it to be a prayer meeting now when we come for a prayer meeting be careful not to give exhortations and exhortations relax give those exhortations another day pray if it's a prayer meeting How, what is a prayer meeting you have a prayer meeting for two hours all right it's scheduled for two hours but all the praying was for 30 minutes that was not a prayer meeting <laughs> Are you there? Yes. Telling you the truth. It wasn't a prayer meeting. But you know, folks, so, sometimes we really have a problem. See, we really have a problem. What is this? Here we come. We're ready for the, for the prayer meeting. But by looking at their faces, you sure can tell these guys are not ready for prayer. So you're going to take the next one hour trying to exhort them about the importance of prayer. By the time you're through, there's no time for them to pray anymore. And you know, if you did say, now let's all pray, you just be there looking at you. It's not ready so real prayer meetings you find that it's for the mature see prayer meetings when we come for prayer meetings we don't need visitors I, I, I get a bit itchy when I find strange faces when I want to have a prayer meeting I'm serious you want to have a prayer meeting you don't you don't you don't want a stranger there it's a special meeting with daddy see when you want to talk to your father come on and it's serious business you want your friend there oh, no 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 don't want him there serious business family matters everybody out you know what i'm talking about yeah because see we might start behaving in a strange way when we start praying you know and with all these kind of guys around we don't want them to think we're stupid or abnormal and they're always forever looking at us. <laughs> Hallelujah. You know, we like to be dignified. You know, we like to come in and, um, you know. But when it comes to prayer meeting, we're ready. You see, well, uh, when I pray, I, I, I love praying alone. Oh, dear Lord Jesus, thank you for listening to us when we're alone. When I start praying alone, I can really have a time. I don't care. I can go on the floor. I can say anything. I can jump, dance. I can I, I do anything. 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 Just, just, just me and him. Praise God. But I can do that when somebody else is there. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to his name forever. All right. Now, so in that chapter three, he, he actually introduces the subject of righteousness that we found out. So in chapter four, he strengthens the same teaching on righteousness and, and then starts letting us know in chapters four, chapters four and five, they are on how it works. He actually explains to us how this thing works, how this righteousness works. He's letting us know how it is obtained, how it works in our lives. He's letting us know, see, in, in chapter 3, he was telling them that it was free. It came free from God. But he had to begin to explain, when you say free, what do you mean? What do you mean free? See, the, 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 the Jewish mind couldn't understand it. So he's, he's explaining how this thing works. So let's look at chapter 4 from verse 1. What shall we then say? Or what shall we say then? That Abraham our father is pertaining to the flesh had found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he had whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. He's letting us know how this thing works. See? Because in chapter 3 he said, we got righteousness by faith freely. So he says, now let me explain it to you how it's free. He says, let's look at Abraham. He says, it is written that Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Okay, so your believing, your believing speaks for righteousness. God can take your believing as an act of righteousness. Oh, I see now. Watch it. 
Verse 4. Now to him that worketh not is reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh... No, no, no. No, no, no. To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. He says, the one who has worked, who has performed, the reward is a debt. Is a debt paid. If he worked for it, and now you're saying he's righteous, after he has qualified for it, he says, no boy, you are, you're owing him. Your own. So that righteousness you gave to him is something that he deserved. It belonged to him. He worked for it. He actually bought it. Are you catching it? He is saying if we were righteous in our actions and then out of our acts of righteousness, God now gave us righteousness and called us righteous. I, I became righteous because of what I did. He says that righteousness is given to me as a, a, a debt paid. Well, that's not before God. Hallelujah. So he says, but, verse 5, but to him that worketh not. See, this guy hasn't done anything to qualify for it. He says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth, that declares righteous the ungodly. The one who hasn't done anything in the sight of God to qualify. He says, the one who believes in that God, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Hallelujah. Even, watch it now, even as David also described the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputed righteousness without works, saying and he quotes blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered blessed is the man to whom the lord will not impute sin hallelujah commit this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the circumcision also on circumcision also for we say that faith was reckoned to abraham for righteousness how was it then reckoned when he was in on in circumcision or in uncircumcision not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. You know what the man is saying? You see, the Jewish people, they said, if you are not circumcised, you, don't, you, you cannot be righteous. You, can, you, you can't have any righteousness in God because circumcision is the seal of the, of the covenant. All right? So the, the, the Gentiles don't have a pact with Jehovah because they are the uncircumcised. Now, Paul takes them up on this. He says, you say Abraham is our father in the flesh. Is that right? And they say, yep, yep, yep. Then he says, tell me, when was Abraham given righteousness? Was it after he was circumcised or before he was circumcised? And they say, hmm. Um, anyway, before. Uh-huh. If Abraham could be called righteous before circumcision. Doesn't that tell you that the Gentiles who are uncircumcised could be righteous? And they scratch their hands and say, ah, oh, Paul, you're too smart, you're too smart, you're too smart. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. So he got them. All right. So, verse 10 again. How was it then reckoned? When he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he, glory to God, might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who also walk in the steps of that faith of our father Abraham, which he had been yet uncircumcised. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, the next portion begins to explain the life of faith, all right? That is from verse 13 to verse um, 20, 20 uh, 21. He lets us know how Abraham believed, all right? And how it works. All right? The, the righteousness of faith, how this thing works. See, we are in the kingdom of faith. See, never underestimate the law of faith. 
See? The law of faith. See, what, what, what's really happening here is the man is going into the Old Testament to show us that the shadow of the real was already in place. That God already was beginning to, was beginning to bless people who acted in real faith, even though the message of faith hadn't come yet. Are you following this? So, you would study that. You see, in Galatians, he tells us, that's well, not certain the book of Galatians, but in Galatians, he tells us that, um, that the, that's in, in, in chapter 4, you read it from verse 1 down. He says that the law was the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. All right? Then he says that um, now that faith has come, we are no longer glory to God on our schoolmaster. Now, the, term, the word that's translated schoolmaster there doesn't mean a, a school teacher. It means one that, that, that it was a servant that took the child to school. All right? So it's not really properly rendered schoolmaster. But that's what they call schoolmaster. It's the one who took the child to school. Okay? So he says the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Praise the Lord. He says, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Amen. We don't need the law that was a schoolmaster. Faith has come now. We are in Christ now. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to his name forever. Glory to his name forever. Hallelujah. So, he screams out in chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Oh, great news. Let's read that again. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. No more struggle. The struggle is over. We're no longer trying to please God. When I fast, I'm not fasting to make God happy. Are you hearing me? When I study the Bible, I'm not studying the Bible to make Him happy. Because He's already happy. I'm not trying to get Him to love me. Because He couldn't love me more. He's already at his best loving me. He couldn't love me any more than he already does. I'm not trying to get him to favor me. I already have his favor. Are you seeing this life? Are you catching it? <laughs> You see something big here. Oh, let's go. Let's go. You see it. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. That's verse 2. Verse 3. And not only so, but we glory. Hallelujah. We glory. Do you glory in tribulations also? Look at this woman. She's gone to church. On coming back, husband, Mr. Husband is waiting at the door. Soon as she enters, he just starts pounding her. You went to that church again, boom, boom, boom. And, and she's so injured. She's so broken. She's so battered. So, what does she do? If I didn't go to church, if Pastor didn't, that service was too long, that's why. No, 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 no. The Bible says we also glory in tribulations. What are you going to do? You know what Paul said? He looked at himself. He had been so beaten. I mean, they wired him. You understand? <laughs> Look at all these marks all over here. He said, henceforth. <laughs> Let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. They call the marks of the Lord Jesus. P 
Peter was beaten. Peter and John, they were beaten, beaten, beaten. You know what they said? They said, isn't it wonderful? Look at us. We were beaten for Jesus. If you know who Jesus is, anything you ever have to suffer for him, you will count it all joy. The Bible says they were so happy that they were worthy to suffer shame for his sake. They were happy to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. That's the same Peter. You see, we read about him in the book of Acts. He was happy to suffer shame. You know what it is for your daddy, your daddy, your daddy, your daddy. You know? Your dad is not a little boy. You know what it is for your daddy to be caught there in the street and then in the presence of your, your mates to be trashed? Daddy. He has a wife. He has children. And then he's beaten in public. Then they kick him. Get out! Get out! Get out! Some young guys were trashing them. Peter, the great apostle, Number one. <laughs> he was trashed. And he wasn't doing, hey! Ah! Oh! Ah! He wasn't doing that. He was happy. He's the same Peter who wrote to us and said, my brethren, if you suffer for doing good, he said, rejoice because the glory of Christ rests on you. That's the man who wrote it. He had gone through it. And the Bible says he rejoiced to suffer shame for the name of Jesus. He counseled us in his own epistle. He said, if you suffer for doing right, he said, rejoice because the glory of Christ rests on you. Hallelujah. So we glory in tribulations. We glory in tribulations, in persecutions. I remember when I first started out, and I would go for meetings, and my dad didn't know that I was the one preaching in those meetings. He didn't know. And I would go for those meetings and come back. A lot of times I came late. And the first night of a program, they didn't know we were having three days. This was the first one. And I've just come home. And they're waiting for me. Where are you coming from? So, so we had a meeting. What kind of meeting? Yeah, well, a Christian meeting. A seminar. Seminar. Oh, I say the convention. All Christian. Any of them. Now he's careful because he doesn't want to offend God. He's a deacon. <laughs> <laughs> then he says to me, if we were not Christians, then you can say we're persecuting you. But we, I, I was a Sunday school teacher before you were born. <laughs> and I'm there like this. Then my mom, you know, sitting beside him and shaking her legs. <laughs> she look at me. <laughs> and I'm looking down at that leg shaking. I know she's trying to tell me there's trouble for you tonight. <laughs> and I'm quiet. And they tell me, don't do it next time. But I know we have a meeting tomorrow. <laughs> Get out of here. I can't remember. The next day, I go through the back door. Did you know sometimes I actually scared you the face? I did. Until my dad got really frustrated. Then he called me one day. I had been fasting. And they had been knocking at the door and I wouldn't open. Then he came by himself and stood at the door and called me and I answered. He said, come out. And I did. 
He said, sit down. See, he had tried everything, so he decided to make it cool. He said, sit down. He said, what are you doing? Have you eaten? I said, no, I have not eaten. He said, why? I said, I'm fasting. He said, what is the problem? <laughs> he wanted to know. It was, you know, for a young guy like this, fasting at home, there's food. What's the matter? He said, is it school? I said, no. Is it, is it at home? Is there any problem? Are you all right? I said, I'm all right. He looked at me. For how long have you been fasting? <laughs> oh, Lord, I think of it now. It's just so funny. He called me the following night. He said, where are you going? He heard I was going out. I said, we have a crusade. Oh. He said, why are you going from crusade to crusade as if you are not saved, looking for salvation? <laughs> Hallelujah. He didn't know I was the one preaching there. He said, why are you looking for salvation? He was troubled. He must have had the same kindred spirit with Paul when Paul said, who had bewitched you? <laughs> Hallelujah. It took him quite some time to discover I was the one preaching. Oh, glory to God. So you see, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Hallelujah. Tribulation worketh patience. And patience, what? Experience. Now you see, oh boy. See, tribulation what? Worketh patience. There are troubles, problems that God allows to come into our lives. We suffer certain things. And then we become, we become more patient. We become more tactful in doing the things we do. And then it says, in patient, uh, it says uh, patience produces what? Experience. And then experience what? Hope. And hope make it not ashamed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we can, we can put that problem in focus and we start watching. We have a better idea. See? We have a better idea. And of course, you know, when we were much younger in the things of God, there just seemed to be something telling us that God only walked in the night. All our meetings ran into the night, late into the night, 11, 12. And we started at 6. At eight, you thought we were about to finish. No, we were just warming up. Now we we'll sing and sing and sing and sing because we needed this thing to get to a spiritual high. You understand? And we kept on singing. And by 9 p.m., some started getting itchy. And we thought, ha, ah, they don't know what they're waiting for. Mm -hmm. By 10 o'clock, now the anointing is just about to begin to come. And then by 11, aha, uh -huh, we were wrong. See? And the tribulation that we got out of it <laughs> produces what? Patience. What kind of patience? See, now you realize that God takes things step by step. You don't, I used to preach until my whole sermon, my whole message ended. I had this outline, I must finish it. Now I preach for three hours. And when you got up, like those two ladies got up just now and sneaked out, ah, I would see you from the father's point. Of view. Stop! <laughs> Our God is a consuming fire. <laughs> and then I'll spend the next 10 minutes just, just unloading on them. I don't feel so bad for ever trying to get up. I come back to the real message. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, we got some troubles out of that, and then we became more patient. And then from patience, we had some experience. We now knew how to handle some things. All right? Praise God. And then experience, hope. 
Amen. We can now look forward. See, hope is, 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 um, is stable. Hope gives you stability. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says in the fifth verse. And hope make it not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. Amen. For when we were, oh boy, we got to take this and, and, and finish. In, 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 oh, come on, follow, follow. Rush out now. Are you ready? For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet for adventure for a good man, some will even dare to die. But God, Mark verse 8, keep it in your heart. But God commended his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us much more than being now justified by his blood we shall be saved from wrath through him for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to god by the death of his son much more being reconciled we shall be saved by his life can you say amen, amen. oh i like it maybe i'll have to stop here i wanted to stop in chapter eight but was the long way off and there's so much to say in chapters 6 and 7. Still a long way off. So, we'll be looking at that in the next class. Praise God. See, we're just beginning to enter into the book of Romans. See, this is a real thing. Just coming in. When you get into chapter 5, and chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9, and then chapter 10, that's the main subject. That's really where it is. Praise God. So we'll go on another time. Any question? Okay, someone has a question over there. There are some courses they used to pray about. Are we the one that, uh, I don't know. Just, <laughs> what is it? Just. <laughs> All right, praise God. Praise God. Now, this is very, very important. I do not have all the time tonight to uh, enlighten you further than what I would say now, but in maybe another service, I probably would talk about it in detail. <laughs> These generational curses that they talk about, believe me, no Christian needs to pray about it. No Christian needs to pray about a generational curse to be lifted from his life or ancestral curse to be taken away from his life nobody no christian needs it why is it preached because of their ignorance you mean those people don't know it they don't because it's too glaring here but just like I said, that dear minister of God who couldn't explain what it is to give one's life to Christ. How do you explain this? Remember, too many people are too busy to read the Bible, including preachers. Some of them are too busy. Sunday morning, they have to carry the Bible. And then, what do you preach? You can go through the scriptures. We'll do it for you. He'll do it. He'll do it. He'll do it. You keep saying he'll do it. 